Hello everybody, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, to his glory forever, Amen. It is important for us, as a group of people, having the same faith, the Christian faith that God has endowed us with, and we're born into it, that we don't just practice it, but also understand it. And we will have a series on this, in understanding our faith, and be able to give answers to people. And this serves not only to debate, but it gives us more confidence as we worship. If you are sure and you are clear about all of the information that the church gives and the Bible gives, and you're able to support them with answers, then you will be deeper in your prayers and in your spiritual life. So we should not take this mental exercise, but we we'll take it spiritual as well. And spirituality lets us try to understand our faith, because we don't have a blind faith. We have faith full of mysteries, but because the Holy Spirit is the one who has unseen work in the faith, hence the seven mysteries of the church. However, everything in the church is explicable and is founded by historical facts that if we know will give us understanding. Today we will try to have a common sense how Christianity is the faith that God intended to have on earth. How it is not part of plurality of faiths but it is the one. It is the one and only and I keep stipulating that we are doing this not to go out and tell people their faith is wrong. This will not be an attraction to Christianity, but rather for ourselves, especially our youth on campuses and in the, in the schools, uh, to know that what they believe in is defensible. So I thought of a general topic. I called it Christianity against all odds. And we will start with this today. Uh, so if we look together, that uh, we're going to present logically that God is behind Christianity. And that's why Christianity existed against things that each one of them would have been a major impediment to the faith, a major obstacle to the faith, and Christianity would not have survived. The whole premise of the study is this verse, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So this is the personal worship of the Lord or the communal also worship of the Lord. And be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope in you. Give that answer with meekness and fear, not with attack, not with ridicule, not with sarcasm. Even if somebody is sarcasm, sar being sarcastic about our faith, we should not stoop down to that level, but rather remember that we should give it with meekness and fear. Be inviting for people to ask more rather than be attacking on other people's faith. And this is mentioned in the first epistle of our teacher, St. Peter, uh, chapter 3, verse 15. So let's talk about the odds against Christianity. Christianity is extremely improbable to succeed. As faith, if we, when we discuss now, each of the obstacles in front of it, logically, if it is not supported by God, it would have failed. And this is the whole premise of the discussion, that Christianity has so many obstacles on it, and if it succeeds against these obstacles, then it must have a power of the Lord behind it. Let us study the odds against which Christianity survived. These odds are extremely high to the point that Christianity surviving these odds is virtually impossible. It's important to note here that in my argument, I'm ignoring all the lovely teachings of Christ. I'm ignoring his sermons that he is God. Uh, I'm not using the Bible. I am using probability uh, to list the obstacles and see that if faith survives all of this, it must be supported by the Lord. So I'm ignoring two big, big supports for Christianity, which is the teachings of Christ and the prophecies of the Old Testament. The prophecies of the Old Testament are very, very profound. And there's uh, studies uh, about how many probabilities uh, that 
for these prophecies to, to exist, to, to point to any other person other than the Lord in the flesh, is virtually impossible. For example, eight prophecies only uh, has been calculated. If you want to have only eight prophecies being pointing to somebody else other than Christ, uh, Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Christ, has said it's like when you tile the whole world with tiles that is one and a half inch square, and under one tile of those only is a quarter, and you go and grab the correct tile out of the whole universe, or the whole world, excuse me, being covered with these tiles, and you get the right one. That's the probability for just eight to, to fit any other person other than Christ. And I'm ignoring this in this study. So big support for Christianity are being thrown out just to discuss the obstacles against it. And we'll see from the obstacles alone that it's impossible to survive these obstacles unless you're supported by the Lord. Let's see this. First obstacle and the highest odd against Christianity, the message of Christianity itself. Let's discuss in layman term what it is. That God became man. We know this happened out of love. For God would not let us perish. And he came to die and give us the keys to overcome death. By believing in him. Because he has resurrected. He overcame death. So God became man and was crucified and rose from the dead. And ascended back to heaven. This message is extremely difficult to accept. For example, if we have a conversation between person A. Who is not... Christian and person B who is, a person A would say, where is Christ? And person B would say, he ascended, so you just have to believe me. That answer cannot satisfy anybody that would say that the Lord came and resurrected and he's no longer here. So we have to accept that we are believing in, in the faith of the Lord and he has left the earth. And that's why St. Paul says it's the foolishness of the gospel. Uh, when you want to ask for the Lord that he was here and left, um, so is there evidence of his presence? Of course, there is evidence of his presence from the history. But we will um, focus here that the message of Christianity itself, that God became man and he died and he ascended, is a difficult message to believe. And St. Paul uh, tells us that the, why the gospel of Christianity seems foolish to the people. So person A continues on asking, why do I believe it? Person B, the resurrection, people saw him. Those who saw him have behaved differently. Um, so please, the Christian person is asking the non-Christian person, being person A or B to A, uh, look at how the Christians behave. And that should be an evidence that um, people are looking for another life, are looking for a, a, a permanent, perfect life. And that's the life with the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. And this is the main stipula stipulation that we see from the first Christian church, how it behaved. So the answer, look at those who preach this, have a completely different view about the importance of life, the importance of love, the contempt for worldly possessions, the contempt of death as they love those who torture them. A, B, C, D, these items are a major support from the lifestyle of those who believed in Christ, that Christ is not dead. He ascended and he went to heaven and has a completely different life waiting for us after death. So um, let's repeat this for again, which is a main characteristic of the Christians, the importance of life for them and its meaning, the importance of love in life, the contempt for worldly possessions and the contempt for death as they love those who torture them. Because somebody can die for a faith he believes in, but no one dies for a lie. There is no one who dies for a faith he does not believe in, who does not have believe it happened truly. So in other religions, for example, if we say martyrdom happens in other religion uh, for other purpose because they believe in the religion. But there is nobody who dies for a religion he does not believe in or, or he thinks it's a lie. So there's no one who will die in Christianity thinking that Christ didn't die and didn't resurrect and didn't ascend. There is no one who will go to death for, for this. So it's very, very important we see in the early church, as we will discuss in detail now, how death became a desire almost to the uh, beginning uh, or early Christians in order to imitate Christ and have contempt for the world. 
So as we said, odd number one is that the, church, the Christianity itself is, um, is difficult to believe in as a message. Its message is that God came to earth, God was killed on earth, and then God resurrected and he ascended. Um, logically thinking, this could be a fairy tale. But practically thinking, we want you to look at the lifestyle of those who were after him. Uh, the people who were uh, going to donate their life and donate their possessions, as we see in the book of Acts. And we see all of his apostles died very poor people, loving the poverty, loving the fellowship of sharing their belongings, and they rushed to death and were not afraid of it. Odd number two, the way the message is being spread. There are three ways to spread any message. Number one, secretly and with deceit. You, you fool people in order to spread that message, in order to make them believe in you. And, and based on this, you ask for their donations, you ask for their belongings, in order for you to have more power and richness. As we can tell, the apostles did not have uh, this desire for money whatsoever, but people voluntarily shared it under their feet, and the disciples um, dedicated themselves to fasting and prayer. With power and compulsion, that's another method to spread a message, to force people to believe in it. And the third message, which the Christianity has used openly, with conviction, and tolerating what happens to you as you spread the message. And that's odd number two, is that how did the disciples spread their message? Christianity, if it was spread by the blood, by shedding blood of those who don't believe in it, that's by force and compulsion. If Christianity was said by bribery in order to reach Nero and have power in the palace, and with this power you can spread that religion, that would still be a worldly method to spread a, a, a faith. But Christianity spread by very normal people, supported by God, and they gave sermons, and they were tolerant of what happens to them because of these sermons. Uh, and it ended to all of them to, to, that they were martyred uh, except for St. John, who was banished to, to the Patmos Island. Remember, if you do it openly, there is no political correctness. It's not like today you can sue somebody who does not give you freedom of religion. Uh, but if there is no political correctness where you can freely speak of Christ at that time, the religious opponents are the Jews and the political opponents are the Roman Empire. The Jews resisted Christianity and the political em uh, empire, uh, sorry, the Roman Empire also Resisted. It became a fierce religious opponent also, as we will see the martyrdoms of Christians. Second point, the punishment is either severe torture, imprisonment, or death. You cannot uh, sue anybody for any of those. So your life is very, very cheap. In fact, in the Roman Empire, if, you're, uh, if your crime is Christianity, you don't get even a legal process. You go directly to condemnation by death. Examples of invented religions at that time. Let us see from history at the same time some examples who came up with religious lies and what happened. These are documented in history. They are documented in the book of Acts also, chapter 5. But the document is from Josephus. Josephus is a historian, a Jewish historian, who um, documents history purely and is one of the biggest support for us Christians to look at history by somebody who was unbiased, as we said, he was Jewish. And we see Christ in his writings. We see St. John the Baptist. We see St. James. Uh, and, and we will quote from him in the Antiquities of the Jews in Book 20 in Chapter 5. So let's see what Josephus writes. For before these days rose up Thudas, this is an inventor of a religion, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to nothing or to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. So the concept we're trying to display here is that if we look at the time where Christianity started, there has been other people who tried to start a movement, start to, to start a religion, and gather many people around them. Now, where are they today? They have perished. They don't exist. These people, did not, their message didn't go anywhere. And look at Christianity till today, it's existing. 
So odd number one, the message itself is hard to believe that God came to earth and was killed and resurrected and ascended. Number two, the method that is you're using to spread the message is only very peaceful and very, and very inviting. And if you get killed, nobody cares. The Roman Empire doesn't care. And actually, in fact, uh, preaching this message is punishable by death. So odd number two, it is not very inviting to, to join this message. And, and as part of this odd is that other people tried to start religions at that time, and they failed. So that's and Judas of Galilee. In the book of Acts, I'm just going to quote it here, uh, because I said in this presentation we'll use more, uh, mostly probabilistic and logical approach uh, for Christianity. But the book of Acts, Gamalael, who is a leader of the Jews, uh, said about these two people um, that they have started a religion and went to nothing. And he was sent to defend St. John and St. Peter uh, because the Jews caught them. And he said, listen, you might be you might be holding two people that are speaking the word of God. So let's hear what he says in order to convince the Jews, St. Hedrin, to let go of St. Peter and St. John. Um, and now I say to you, refrain from these men. He talks about refrain from hurting St. Peter and St. John. He's, he's a Jewish leader, very, very big, respectable one. Uh, and he asked the St. John and St. Peter to step outside and is now addressing the Sanhedrin, telling them, basically, listen to me and let's think through it. And let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it, is, if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply you be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, after they agreed to let them go, they still beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And in the daily in the temple and every house, they ceased not to teach. Obviously, they didn't heed the advice or the threat, rather, but they continued to teach and preach Jesus Christ, although they were just punished by beating. So look at Gamalaiel's advice. He's telling us, basically, telling the Jews, if this, if this message is from man, we have Thudas and Judas of Galilee as examples who started something. But if it is from God, be careful, because we might be opposing the word of God. The rest of the Sanhedrin did not listen to their teacher, and they continued persecuting them. Odd number three. God left behind not thousands of people. He did not do preaching to bring thousands. And then he said, that's a good critical mass to, and then I can ascend. But he left a very few number. God left behind few people, 82, which basically 12 apostles, 12 disciples and 70 apostles, plus some believers. Remember, they speak openly. They don't use any power. And they don't use any deceit or plot to raise money or make money or break families, like shunning if your, if your husband doesn't believe, let him go and you stay with the church uh, or, or divorce him. Uh, the, the, the message of the, of the Bible kept the family intact. And St. Paul is telling us the unbeliever is sanctified in the believer. Uh, the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the believing wife and vice versa. The unbelieving wife is sanctified in the believing husband which is applicable only to that time, which is when Christianity enters and you have a house where the husband is believing and the wife didn't believe, the Bible is telling them, do not divorce her, stay in the marriage and vice versa. If the husband doesn't believe and the wife believes, do not divorce him, stay in the marriage. So Christianity did not break families, even if a focal member of the family did not believe. Um, why was it hard that these 82 leaders would be contained by the Jews or the Romans and killed? And that would be the end of story. There's just 82. That is a very small number. How come they survive without any weapons except their speech and loving actions? If you read any history, you find the early churches has not been involved in any forceful action. How come when some of them were murdered, the others did not run away and get weaker or at least decided to use swords and fight back? So you have a people of preachers, you beat them, you kill them, and the followers don't run away. They stay and they welcome death. So logically, this is impossible that you start with a small number that's 82 and the number grows 
and it grows in the middle of persecution, in the middle of torture. And the only, only strength you have is your words and your faith. Let us hear St. Peter in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. But as he, was, as he which has called you in, is holy, so be ye holy in every conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So the faith also invites us to not act conforming to the world. It asks us to be holy. And being holy is not something really easy to do. So the message as a behavior is not an easy way to behave in this world uh, and act in a holy way. So this is an another odd in the message that's difficult to behave in a true Christian way. So the, the faith message is difficult to believe. Preaching it is in a way that's very peaceful and only using your words. And if you get punished by death, nobody cares. You cannot go back and sue the system. Number three, you find only 82 people starting, a very small number. That's another obstacle against Christianity. It did not start with thousands of people by the time Christ ascended. And we see now the, 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 the conduct of it, you have to be holy. Um, and, and, and that is not an attractive message uh, in the world with all of its temptation. So St. Paul, who was a fierce Jew against the church, has converted, and he says in Philippians 3, from 5 to 8, I am circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, the Jewish zeal, or the faith I was born in, I was so zealous that I was persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. I did everything in the law. But what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowing knowledge of Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do not count them but rubbish that I may win Christ. So the premise of joining Christianity is giving up things, is losing things. St. Paul was so reputable, so respectable, so powerful, so religious, so zealous for the faith that he was born in. And when he became Christian, he lost so many worldly privileges because of that faith. So it is an uphill to join the faith, not something you gain by joining it. Example of the tribulations that he had to go through because of joining the faith. Here they are in 2 Corinthians 11. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. 39, that is. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in the water. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. This is the state of somebody who designs to follow that group. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, watchings means staying up late in vigils, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are outside or that are without, that which comes upon me daily from within, which is the care for all the churches. Uh, another proof of Christianity comes from history. Josephus is documenting the killing of St. James, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem, and he writes in Book 20, Chapter 9, Ananus assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, because St. James is the cousin of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the cousin in the Jewish tradition is called the brother, who was called Christ, of Jesus, brother of Jesus, who was Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So the disciples of Christ were not very respectable people in the, in, in the way that you, the untouchable, but they were in fact being killed, and St. James was um, killed in Jerusalem. A documentation from history about, about St. James. On number four, the 82 were all martyred in service publicly, publicly in order to scare the people not to believe in the faith anymore. The most divisible are St. Peter and St. Paul. 
and some mark in Egypt. What do the people see in this public torture that ends with death, that makes them want to follow what these people believe in? Again, what do the spectators see in this public torture of St. Peter or St. Paul or St. Mark, which ends with their death, that makes these believers believe in the faith? And that's how Christianity grew, witnessing the martyrdom and the courage of the martyrs and their belief in the the better life after this made people follow. So they couldn't see it as the people were martyred. And yet they believed. How come this faith grows? It is all counterintuitive. They have no richness. They are tortured. They preach love and peace and do not fight back. God whom they are preaching does not come and save them from death, although they are dying for him. What is making, making people at the beginning of Christianity follow this faith. Joining it is nothing but trouble for the believers. The fifth odd and a very powerful one, the testimony of history of the Roman persecution. 300 years, let me repeat again, 300 years of a very fierce, powerful empire trying to eradicate this faith. It became an enemy of the empire. They're doing every effort to get rid of this new sect. For the Roman Empire, worshipping idols is not optional. It is part of serving the country, specifically serving in the army. It is part of serving in the army to defend the empire. You would be a traitor if you don't offer incense to the idols. Christians would not worship the idols, so the Roman Empire put an effort to annihilate Christians. Some counter-argument by atheists. Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire because of disruption in the in the social and civil system, legal reasons, not faith reasons, they were persecuted. Uh, they tried to make the faith that is that is uh, what, that that is was not being persecuted by the empire, hence belittling the martyrdom. This is what the atheist is trying to do. The, that the attack on Christianity was basically carried out by the Roman Empire because they perceived the Christians were social revolutionists. Uh, they were not mart killing them for their faith in order to remove the concept that the martyrdom of Christian had anything to do with the support of God or the testimony for the faith. Let's answer that very, very simply. Christian behavior within the empire answers that the Roman Empire they have no reason to persecute Christians. Christians preach purity and fighting on a personal level, the sexual immorality, the body is the temple of the Lord. Christians preach peace, but in the meantime defending the country if, in, if enlisted in the army. Christians preach accepting the government, except for idol worship. So there is nothing that Christians do that is against the legal system of the country. Their behavior is different, but their presence in the country, they are following it completely. For example, Christians are asked the slaves to obey the master. So hence, Christians uh, leaders, St. Paul, did not encourage slaves to, to revolt against their masters, but rather uh, they encouraged them to obey them and encourage them that when you go to church with them, don't think that you're higher than your master because you're taking communion with him at the same time. Christians urge husbands, as we said before, who believe in Christ in a non-Christian family and urge wives who believed in non-Christian families not to leave the spouse if the spouse is willing to stay in the marriage. So the, the employment fabric, which is masters and slaves, and the social fabric, which is the family life, was promoted to be intact by Christians. What Christian advised about slavery is that master be merciful with your slaves and slaves obey your masters. It made it an employment, it made it a communal of love, but it never asked the slaves to be at the same footing of the masters because they believe in the same faith. Hence, it kept a backbone of the social fabric of the empire. I'm answering the point that atheists may raise the Christians were persecuted because they had a social revolution within the empire. So in terms of master-slave relationship, it kept it the same, but it asked those to treat it with love, even asked the slaves to obey their masters, even they are wicked, not to revolt against them, and to be an example of obedience, even the master is, is not obedient. And it kept the house intact. It doesn't shun the unbeliever. It doesn't kick out the non-Christian, but in fact, urges the family to stay intact. And the third one, which is very, very important for a country, 
it compelled Christians to pay taxes and customs. Although the country you're in is atheist, or the country you're in is pagan, then still you have to pay the customs and you have to pay the taxes. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Again, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And he means by this the earthly powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So we accept the system we're under as being ordained by God. Continue on this. Then give to all their dues. To the one due tax, the tax. To the one due tribute, the tribute. To the one due fear, the fear. To the one due honor, the honor. So give, live in the society as example of obedience in the society. We see here, this is basically, instead of reading it in this First Corinthians chapter 7, 13 to 15, is what I've been talking about, urging the husbands and the wives to obey and to stay with the unbeliever uh, because the, the family unity is very important. Let me just add something important here. This doesn't apply today. This applied then because when Christianity came, one household would believe and one would not. But today, for two people to get married, they both have to be in the faith of the church. Christian system for slaves, very, very important. Uh, I, I touched on this, but I mentioned here in, in details in Ephesians 6, 5 to 8. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh. Masters according to the flesh, your, your bosses. With fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. How could this be any push but to believe your uh, to, to, to as a Christian to be obedient to your master there is no even scent or a small hint of any revolution not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So, we answer three points that people may raise as a reason for persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. Namely, they probably did not want to pay taxes. We can see here in Romans 13, they are urged to it. The family life might have been threatened. No, in 1 Corinthians 7 big urge that the family stays together and the master-slave relationship in Ephesians 6 St. Paul is compelling with very strong words that servant Christians should stay loyal and honest with their masters even if their masters were not Christian doing this service as if they are doing it to Christ himself what what more perfect of a social system of obedient people who believe in God and offer no revolution. So the only reason the Roman Empire persecuted Christians is because of the power of the Roman Empire to kill this God that this new sect is believing in. We have proven very clearly that there is nothing that Christians did as social members of the society that would provoke the Roman Empire except one thing, which is offering idols, offering incense to idols because it is completely opposite to worshiping God. Christian system for masters. And you masters do the same things unto them for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So St. Paul urging the masters who believe, because those who don't believe obviously will not heed this, but the masters who are Christians, he's urging them convert your relationship with God with, with, with your slaves to be a relationship of employment. Be merciful to them. And the slaves, regardless, as we said, have to obey their masters. So conclusion of this, of the social fabric of Christians in the society. So Christians are truly model citizens, yet the Roman Empire, based on hating this higher moral code, decided to remove Christians. There are no laws to prevent the Roman Empire from doing this. No legal system for the Christians to appeal to. 
very big odd against the spirit of Christianity. There is nowhere to go. Your punishment is death and the whole system is against you. How, who would join a religion like this where you have nowhere to go? Um, you're, you're really joining the, 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 the murdered group and yet it increased, increased, increased till today. It is a, a, a millions and millions of people believe in it because of this correct beginning because it's founded on the Lord. So what is expected? Let's see what's given, given the following. Christ is not here, he ascended. As we said, odd number one, the foolishness of the message itself. Number two, Christians have no army to fight back. They are just people. All what they do is they preach and they act in, as model citizens. Three, they are ridiculed all the time due to their beliefs as a way of pure living in a society that the Roman Empire promoted impure living and sexual immorality and the Greek gods part of the worshipping them was there is promiscuity and sexual immorality and these Christians are ridiculed for their virginity and their behavior in this pure way. So the first Roman emperor will have no problem to kill them all. As we said, we started by 82. If they grew a little bit, they would be in the hundreds. So Nero would have gotten rid of all of them and Christianity would be sayonara, goodbye. There is no longer that faith anymore. So let's look at the Roman Empire. Now we have 10 Roman emperors over 300 years trying to do that by killing Christians. I mean, killing no mercy after torturing them in order to make them a spectacle after torturing them publicly and yet this mighty empire was not able to get rid of Christianity think logically about this a little bit with the previous slide about what Christianity is and what power it's against and tell me really how would this survive moreover in 312 Christianity became an accepted faith of the empire it just does not make any sense how can this weak faith that believes in God who died, survive all of this. I'm asking and imploring the viewers to really think logically about this. This is really a probabilistic approach to believing in Christianity. The Roman emperors, persecution under Nero, traditional martyrdoms of St. Peter and St. Paul, persecution under Domitian, persecution under Trajan, Christianity is outlawed by Christians, but Christians are not sought out. Persecution under Marcus Aurelius, martyrdom of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. Persecution under Septimus Severus. Persecution under Decius. Christians are actively sought out by requiring public sacrifice. They could buy certificates called the libeli or the libeli instead of sacrificing. Martyrdoms of bishops of Rome and Jerusalem and Antioch. And look at the word martyrdom here is not simple. This is killing. Killing with no mercy to get rid of them. Get rid of Christianity completely. Persecution under Valerian, and this is the martyrdom of St. Cyprian of Carthage and Sixtus II of Rome. Persecution under Maximus, Maximinus the Thracian. Persecution under Aurelian. Severe persecution under Diocletian and Galerius and Maximianus, and this is called the Great Persecution, uh, which is the major, very, very strong bloodshed against the Christians. Um, it's uh, in, in Nero from 64 to 68 is reported to have tortured Christians with great cruelties for his own enjoyment. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, Tacitus was pagan. He was not Christian. And, I, and we love, we love when we quote history by non-Christians. Besides being put to death, they, the Christians, were made to serve as objects of amusement. For it was felt that they were being destroyed not for the public good, but to satisfy the cruelty of an individual. Tacitus is saying this as documenting, and Tacitus was a pagan historian. Despite these extreme cruelties, Nero's persecution was local and short-lived. However, it was the first official persecution and marked the first time the government distinguished Christians from Jews. Tertullian referred to persecution of Christians as institutum Neronianum, an institution of Nero. After Nero, it became a capital crime to be a Christian. Although pardon was always available if one publicly condemned Christ and sacrificed to the gods. There's no freedom anymore. There is no freedom to Christians anymore. Uh, Domitian is recorded as having executed members of his own family on charges of atheism and Jewish manners. 
who are thus generally assumed to have been Christians. In 112 AD, Rover governor Pliny the Younger was sent by the Emperor Trajan to the province of Bithynia on official business. During his visit, Pliny encountered Christians and he wrote to the Emperor about them. The governor indicated that he had ordered the execution of several Christians, quoting, For I held no question that whatever it was they admitted, in any case obstinacy and unbending per perversity, deserved to be punished. And it was punished by death. This is Pliny who works under Trajan, killing the Christians he met. Marcus Aurelius, Philip Schaff, great historian, contemporary historian in history of the church, which is a nine-volume encyclopedia, he wrote, a law was passed under his reign, punishing everyone with exile who should endeavor to influence people's mind by fear of the divinity. And this law was, no doubt, aimed at the Christians. At all events, his reign was a stormy time for the church. Marcus Aurelius. Although the persecution cannot be directly traced to him, the law of Trajan was sufficient to justify the severest measures against the followers of the forbidden religion. And the law of Trajan was basically that Christianity is an outlawed religion. It was during the reign of Marcus Aurelius that Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, was martyred. Later, there is record of new decrees making it easier for Christians to be accused and have their property confiscated. In 177, 48 Christians were martyred in the amphitheater of Lyon, modern France. Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian, granted Christians even more concessions, also responding to a request for advice from his governors. This time in Western Asia Minor, Hadrian decreed the Christians could be brought to trial, but only for specific illegal acts. But they don't need to bring them for trial. If they are professing Christianity, they can be put to death. Significantly, therefore, being a Christian was no longer sufficient in itself to merit arrest. So, in fact, Hadrian gave, gave actually some more leeway to the Christians. He took it uh, that Christianity was not a good enough cause to put person to to death. He, he gives some, some comfort uh, or some uh, breathing room. Severus, the Emperor Severus, may not have been personally ill disposed towards Christians, but the church was gaining power and making many converts, and this led to popular anti Christian feeling and persecution in Carthage, Alexandria, Rome, and Corinth between about 202 and 210. The persecution under Decius was the first universal and organized persecution of Christians and it would have lasting significance for the Christian church. In January of 250, Decius issued an edict requiring all citizens to sacrifice to the emperor in the presence of a Roman official and obtain a certificate, a libelous, proving they had done so, 44 of these libeli have survived. So some people caved in and offered incense to the idols, and some major martyrs uh, didn't and were tortured. Under Valerian, who took the throne in 253, all Christian clergy were required to sacrifice to the gods. This is targeting the leaders as before they were uh, killing the bishops. In a 257 edict, the punishment was exile. In 258, the punishment was death. Christian senators, knights, and ladies were also required to sacrifice under pain of heavy fines, reduction of rank, and later, death. Finally, all Christians were forbidden to visit their cemeteries. Among those executed under Valerian were St. Cyprian, the Bishop of Car Carthage, and Sixtus II, Bishop of Rome. According to a letter written by Dionysius during this time, men and women, young and, young and old, maidens and matrons, soldiers and civilians of every age and race, some by scourging and fire, others by the sword, have conquered in the strife and won their crowns. Winning the crowns, my, my brothers and sisters and, and children, is basically death that is rewarded by the crown of life, eternal life. The one who is patient till the end will be saved. But we can see every demographic was believing in Christianity and seeing the torture that happens to them is by no means an encouragement to the spectators to join the religion. And yet it was, because there was a divine power of healing. 
if God decides that the martyr would not be killed at that time and get healed completely. There are tortures that led to the death of the martyr and there are tortures that led the imprisonment to the martyr because he can no longer be tortured, there's nothing to do or the torturers got weary of him and next day he would be completely cured. Uh, these events uh, definitely were a big proponent for the spectators to just say, we confess in the God of the person who's being martyred. We confess in the God of St. George. Not knowing him, but if he can do this healing, we do. If you don't believe this, there is no logical explanation that the spectators who are not compelled but to leave the faith and not believe in it and go home uh, and they do the opposite. They join the faith, knowing that it's punishable by death and torture in front of them. Put yourself in their shoes. You're seeing somebody being tortured and persecuted for a faith you don't believe in. Why would you join it? So this is the core. The Christianity was supported by God, that you have this mighty empire trying to remove it, and yet we are in, year, in the middle of the third century now, and Christianity is flourishing and growing, not diminishing, and they are trying to, 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 to track the last remnant left out of them. You can see here maidens and matrons, soldiers and civilians, and as we read before, knights, and, and people in the palace. Uh, this is not faith that is spread by bribery. Definitely, the faith is not by f spread by force. It's actually every force is being acted upon it uh, and not spread by deceit and not spread by revolution. It is every logical thing, if you accumulate them, every probability is acting against Christianity and Christianity still survived. The persecution ended with the capture of Valerian by Persia. Valerian's son, the successor Galenius, revoked the edicts of his father. And we find now the master or the biggest power of persecution, Diocletian. The last major Roman persecution of Christians occurred under Diocletian, and it was the worst of all. It was known, or it is known in history, as the Great Persecution. In any case, Diocletian published four edicts. Of 303 to 304, the emperor ordered the burning of Christian books and churches. The Diocletian persecution turned out to be the extremely violent. This violence did not succeed in annihilating Christianity, but caused the faith of the martyrs to blaze forth instead. The persecution raged longest and most fiercely in the east under the rule of Galerius and his barbarous nephew Maximian Daza, whom we call Maximianus. Let's see the church history by Eusebius of Caesarea, who was an eyewitness to it. Even the wild beasts, he says, not without rhetorical exaggeration, at last refused to attack the Christians as if they had assumed the part of men in place of the heathen Romans. The bloody swords became dull and shattered. The executioners grew weary and had to relieve each other. But the Christians sang hymns of praise and thanksgiving in honor of the Almighty God, even to their latest breath. So Justin Martyr, who was a philosopher, converted to Christianity in the second century, though beheaded, beheaded and crucified and thrown to wild beasts and chains and fires and all other kinds of torture, we do not give up our confession, but the more such things happen, the more do others in larger numbers become faithful. How is this logically possible? How is this logically possible? That you have this fact in the second century by a pagan convert. St. Justin Martyr was a philosopher. He was a Platonist. This is another thing that we should cover in the faith later on, the, the, the apologetics or the father's who were enlightened uh, by Christianity and found it as the answer of all of the Greek philosophies that were looking for a supreme being. And that's basically by uh, Plato. Um, we, this is not a topic here, but Justin Martyr was one of them. He actually says in his biography uh, and in his defense against uh, Trifo and his defense against the Roman Empire, uh, he says that I was born to become a Christian. My mind was basically directed step by step through Greek philosophy unintentionally that when I found Christianity, it made fitting to everything Greek philosophers 
were looking for, if they were looking for a deity or a supreme being. Uh, because Greek philosophy presented to the world a very excellent way of thinking uh, and a very elevated way of looking uh, at, at our life. Not all of them, of course, but, but it, it, it opened the mind to uh, big philosophical questions that when Christianity came, because God is the, the wisdom himself and philosophy is the love of wisdom, was basically the, the filling in the blanks of every open thought that these philosophers were putting. And hence, the true philosophers believed in Christianity. I love this quotation by Philip Schaff, who is a historian. No other religion could have stood for so long a period the combined opposition of Jewish bigotry, Greek philosophy, and Roman policy and power. The Jews, of course, were persecuting Christians as opposition of the faith. They are uh, preaching a false messiah. This is their opposition to Christianity and denouncing as if it's denouncing the, all the Old Testament. Greek philosophy ridicules the concept of God being in the flesh and dying and resurrected. Uh, it doesn't match with the, the deity they are trying to look for. Um, and the Roman policy and power, as we said, uh, although the lifestyle of Christians did not cause them any threat, yet um, the purity of Christians and not being uh, accepting except the Lord Christ and hence not offering incense to, to the emperor uh, made the Roman Empire um, be very, very strong opponent to the church. So Philip Schaff is listing these three major, major powers that oppose the believers, uh, the Jewish opposition, the Greek philosophy and the Roman policy and power. No other could have triumphed at last over so many foes by and we keep repeating this, purely moral and spiritual force without calling any carnal weapons to its aid. Testimony to our faith, to our author of faith by Josephus. So did Christ exist? Is there any evidence outside the Bible written by historians? Let's read Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man. If it be lawful to call him a man, this is Josephus talking about the man Jesus. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. He might not be meaning here he was the awaited Messiah, but he was anointed. He was like a prophet. He existed. The whole point of this is that Christ existed in history and we see this in the testimony of a Jewish historian. Um, I urge everybody to, to, to look at his writings. It's, a, it's very big and detailed. But if you want to know about events outside the Bible that was happening at the time of the Bible, and even, and I mean by that, the Old Testament as well, uh, Josephus captured this very, very well. He continues, And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, us because he's Jewish and he's confessing that the Jewish men are the ones who suggested to Pilate the crucifixion. Again, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct at this day, as Josephus writes, and he lived in the first century. Josephus tells about St. John the Baptist, another evidence outside the Bible about people in the Bible. Now, some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God. And that very justly as a punishment of what he did against John. He names John the Baptist. That was called the Baptist. For Herod slew him, as the Bible says. But Herod, Josephus is mentioning it historically. Who was a good man and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue. St. John the Baptist being present in the writings of Josephus. Christ being present in the writings of Josephus. Who was a historian of the Jewish history of the world history, but he was Jewish. And he. this is all we have been trying to do in this talk is to bring logical 
proofs from outside the Bible about the validity of Christianity. We continue on St. John the Baptist. Both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism, for that the washing with water would be acceptable to him if they made use of it, not in order to the putting away or the remission of some sins only, but for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified beforehand by righteousness. Josephus writing about St. John the Baptist. So let's write a summary now um, about the odds that were against Christianity and, 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 and we see from these odds basically uh, we contemplate how could a movement survive these odds? What is the probability to survive any of them? What is the probability to survive all of them stacked against one another? And the answer basically it had to have divine power. So let's, let's list the odds again. Number one, the message itself, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. Also the Lord who was here is not here anymore. People claim that they saw him after the resurrection, but not everybody did. So that was by, God, by God's design is that the resurrection is made private, although the crucifixion was public, to make it even harder to believe in Christianity and that supports more that he will do the work and make the people believe. This is this feeds in more and more and more that the message of believing in this Christianity is, is not easy. It is not a common sense thing. Um, and and as, as, as we say here and we keep saying this over and over, the message is difficult. What it asks for is difficult. Christ was seen crucified truly but he was not seen resurrected and this makes a burden on the believers to preach him being resurrected and people haven't seen him but that was by God's design in order to assure us that this difficult message because it's difficult it has to have the power of God to support it you cannot do it on your own you cannot preach that Christ resurrected you believe it and the death of the uh, Christians for this faith as we said you cannot die for a lie uh, the, the made, made it more plausible that people are going to death confessing that Christ resurrected Number two, the number of people who believed it and before Christ's ascension, uh, it started with 82 people, a very small number. The 82 people were persecuted at the end, killed, all of them except for St. John who died naturally, but he was also exiled. Uh, odd number four, the severe persecution of the ruthless Roman Empire for more than 300 years. Uh, please let us thank God that we are really believing in this faith um, it is it is going to be persecuted day after day after day uh, it might not be by swords although in some places of the world it is but it might be by pluralism relativism um, science which will associate different types of of talks in this series to answer uh, scientific uh, challenges uh, the, the all of this uh, it's going to be answered in a, in a, in a, in a series of, of talks or programs so that we can have really uh, deeper prayer and deeper worship because our questions are being answered. I just want to uh, beg every viewer, if you are challenged at school by a question you can't answer, if you are challenged at the university by a question you can't answer, if it makes you doubt Christianity, very often the speaker are taking advantage of your lack of knowledge and they ask this doubtful question. Um, we have answers for everything. Bring the questions. Write them to uh, god.iroom at gmail.com, god.iroom at gmail.com, and we will dedicate uh, questions uh, and answer sessions or programs depending on how detailed the answer needs to be. I will welcome your feedback. And we made this a little bit detailed and one-sided uh, lecture because I really wanted to focus on logically, uh, probabil probabilistically, mathematically without using numbers but common sense. Uh, if you stack the probabilities against Christianity, how could it survive? The faith is given by Christ and it was delivered to us by the apostles. 
and it was kept by the church fathers. And that's why uh, our church is apostolic and we read for the church fathers because they are the followers or the successors of the apostles who were uh, ordained by Christ himself who came and gave us the faith in him. To Christ is the glory with his good Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen.